Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to my crash course in formal logic. For those of you who have made it this far, i got to admire your diligence. In this section, we're going to start to study squares of opposition and their features, and we're going to move on to start doing some genuine category logic in just a few more lessons. So, now remember, quality and quantity are the only attributes of categorical, categorical positions. Uh, or categorical propositions. There is no such thing as a qualifier. I find students introducing that term into, uh, often, so bear it in mind. Let's talk about quality and quantity a little bit. Now the quality of a sentence tells you whether it's affirmative, which is to assert class membership, or negative, which denies class membership. So all SRP and some SRP are your affirmative sentences because they are basically telling you that some S are included in the P category. Now no S are P and some S are not P. Obviously those are negative. You can tell by the words no and the not in the copula on the uh, latter example. Quantity on the other hand uh, either asserts universal regarding every member of a class or it's particular. It regards at least one member of a class. So all SRP and no SRP are your universals uh, because they either universally assert or universally deny uh, membership in a class. By way of contrast, some SRP and some S are not P. Those are particular. Obviously that word some gives it away, right? So when I lay out our propositions with the universals at the top and the particulars at the bottom, notice I put the negatives over to the right and the positives over to the viewer's left, uh, you can tell that they kind of form a square and people have uh, recognized that for quite a number of years. They've actually given names to these sentence types, these categorical sentence types. Uh, the universal uh, affirmative is, well, that's designated with the letter A the universal negative with the letter E, I's are particular affirmatives, and O's are your particular negatives. Now you're probably looking at A, E, I, and O and wondering where's the Y? Well, I want to tell you why. Well, as you know, Aristotle was the one who developed logic, but most of Aristotle's work was lost to the Western world until it was recovered in the High Middle Ages. Uh, in the meantime, all they had to work with was his logic. And since the people, the lingua franca of the day was Latin, uh, here's what you get. Uh, the universals and the particulars uh, in their designated spots, but going up to down, the affirmative sentences, the Latin term affirmo, has uh, the first two vowels in it that, well, designated those sentence types. And you can see uh, the Latin term for I deny, uh, the verb, nego, on the right. And so basically, uh, this is a, a relic of the, well, Latin language that was used in the academies of the uh, Middle Ages. So let's return to our topic. When people started to examine this table, uh, they found certain relationships held between certain uh, sentences. Uh, for Aristotle and for the scholars of the Middle Ages, if you knew that A was false, that directly implied that the universal negative was true, indicated here in the red and green for you. And if the universal negative is true, well, if no S or P, that directly denies that some S or P. And actually, they drew another relationship. If they, uh, if they saw that some S or P is false, uh, they drew the conclusion that some S are not P, for reasons that we'll go into in the next lecture. But for now, just memorizing the order of the table is important. So you got a couple ways here. Uh, you can remember your vowels, conveniently spe spelled out A, E, I, and O. I find that most students find that helpful. Uh, or you can remember your Latin, affirmo and nego. So this table pretty well summarizes uh, everything that we've covered so far. You have the propositions, the four categorical sentence types that we'll be using in this course, each designated with a letter name and each uh, distinguished in terms of their quantity and quality. No sentence uh, in our list has the exact same quantity and quality as another. And that's a good way to keep everything nice and distinct. Well, now I need to talk a little bit about distribution. Uh, that's a technical term pertaining to subjects and predicates and propositions. Uh, a term is said to be uh, distributed 
just in case it makes an assertion about every member of that class. And remember, categorical sentences always involve two classes. One may be distributed and the other not. So if it doesn't tell you something about every member of a class, then it's going to be called undistributed. So this table basically summarizes everything that we've studied so far and what lies ahead. You notice that I just added one new column to the table, uh, one for uh, distribution. Turns out that the A sentences, all S or P, distributes the subject, and that's pretty obvious why that would be the case. Now this E sentences, no S or P, distributes both the subject and predicate, and Obviously, uh, if you know that some S are P, the I sentence, uh, that distri distributes neither the subject or predicates. It doesn't really tell us, uh, it only tells us about what's the case for one subject. And you'd think the same thing would happen with the O sentences. Some S are not P. As it turns out, they distribute the predicate. And I'm going to explain why that's the case here in just a minute. So let's go over an explanation for each. Suppose you know that all S are P. Everything in the subject class is corralled, so to speak, by this blacking out into the predicate class. Well, if all S are P, we certainly do know something about every S. They're, they're all P. However, we can't tell whether or not all the P's are or are not S's. I'll illustrate that. Remember in our example of all athletes are healthy eaters? That tells us about all the athletes out there. What it doesn't tell us about is all the healthy eaters. Uh, surely there have to be, even if that statement's true, there have to be a lot of healthy eaters out there besides the athletes. And that would be the remainder of us who take care of ourselves. So let's, let's talk a little bit about E sentences, the ones that say that no S or P. If no S or P, you know something about every member of the S class and about every member of the P class. Every S fails to be a P and every P fails to be an S. So that's what happens when you block out this section here in the middle. You can see now that no, nothing's allowed to have mutual membership in both classes at the same time. So in our example involving skateboarders, we said that uh, no skateboarders are persons allowed in the city uh, on uh, public sidewalks. That tells you a lot about the, those skateboarders, uh, but it also tells you about people who are allowed to be on public sidewalks. Uh, but what you know about them is they all fail to be skateboarding. Now the I sentences give us the least amount of information with respect to S and P. Uh, we, we really know nothing about every S and every P. All we know is that there's one uh, member marked with the X here in the center, uh, which is a member of both. But there may or may not be S's that are not P's or vice versa. You may recall the example that I gave earlier involving a malfunctioning computer. If you know that one of your computers or something that is my computer or a computer of mine is a malfunctioning thing, that certainly doesn't tell you about whether or not you've got other computers and whether or not they're malfunctioning. And it certainly doesn't tell us about every malfunctioning thing on the planet. It's just one bit of information that says there's a m member that occupies the position in both categories. Now let's talk about the most difficult case, the O sentences. Some S are not P. We do know something about every P from that sentence. Every P fails to be identical to at least one S. Now that may sound a little bit pedantic, but it's actually an important point, and I'll explain that. Alternatively, you could think about it as class P fails to completely encompass S. So no matter what, P is not going to be sufficient to completely envelop or uh, cover or all the members of S. And another way to think about it, if you recall our uh, example involving uh, rainbows and pots of gold, uh, not every rainbow has a pot of gold, which means some rainbows are not things that have pots of gold. Now, for all that tells us, uh, we can't tell whether S completely encompasses P or not. Maybe rainbows are the only thing on the planet that has pot of, pots of gold in it. I haven't seen a pot of gold in my lifetime, but for all that sentence tells me, uh, rainbows might be the only sp place to find them. 
Okay, by now I'm starting to get even bored myself. So uh, you might be wondering why care about distribution? Why is this an important concept to wrap our minds around? Well, distribution tells you how much information about a class, whether the subject or predicate, that the categorical proposition contains. And the reason why that's important is that uh, it measures how much you can deduce from those conclusions. In other words, when we start putting together logical arguments, you need to have as much information on the class and the premises as you have in the conclusion. Because one principle of deduction that we studied earlier is that the conclusion is never allowed to go beyond the prem uh, premises. It just teases out information that was already there. So for example, if you have a term that's distributed in your conclusion, it had better have been distributed at least once in your premises. Well, Patrick Hurley's logic book gives us uh, some mnemonic devices that might be helpful for you, and I'm going to list them right here. Uh, unprepared students never passed. That basically stands for universals distribute subjects and, ne and negatives distribute predicates. But the one I like better is any student earning B's is not on probation. That's an easy way to remember that A's uh, A sentences uh, distribute the subject, E sentences distribute both the subject and predicate, uh, I sentences distribute neither, and the O sentences, well, they distribute the predicate as we just explained. So I hope that was helpful for you. Um, memorize some principles of distribution. They'll help you with your logic later on. And otherwise, I hope this video has given you a more firm grasp of the principles of uh, logic. Next up, we're going to start studying immediate inferences.